We're honored to have Joey and Mackenzie with us this morning. Bonnie Uto, there are missionaries, and now you're in Jordan, correct? <coughs> They're in a part of the world where it's not even considered safe to preach the gospel. Joey don't want me to tell this, but he's already been beaten for the sake of the gospel, and he still goes back. And I want to say that uh, as we were in Israel, in Jerusalem, there was a Muslim quarter, a Jewish quarter, and a Christian quarter. And uh, I want you to know that one of these days, one king will reign from Jerusalem, and it'll all be his kingdom. But I want you to welcome Joey and Mackenzie, two people who put their lives on the line to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, just make them welcome as they come to share. And then there will be ushers at the, at the back of the church. And if you want to support their ministry, we'd love for you to do that financially. Come on up, y'all. Another. You send the ugly one first, huh? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Sort of. Now, so many young people come here to go to Wesleyan, and God gets a hold of their heart here, and we're so thrilled about that. Uh, church, thanks for having us. Uh, Mackenzie, you can stand up real quick. This is my amazing wife. Um, she keeps me in line, so thank God for her. Uh, we're actually going to start with a quick video this morning. I think we can cue that up, and then uh, I'll share afterwards. So enjoy. Thank you guys. Uh, once again, that's my better half, Mackenzie, putting the video together, so thank God. Um, guys, it's an honor to be with uh, you this morning. Uh, the thing that pro we've probably learned most this year, so as many of you know, we were starting in uh, Israel this past year. Uh, we were there for about a week. Uh, in that time, we purchased a vehicle. We were really sinking in our roots, and we had two team members that were coming late, and uh, they got stopped at the border. Uh, they, they spoke Arabic, so the government kind of confused them as being like pro-Muslim and pro-Palestinian. So the Israeli government obviously had a problem with that. And we had two team, team members after a week of us being there get a 10-year ban to the country of Israel. So it was really uh, our first step uh, was to, to get our team together because one of our mottos is never go alone just based on uh, one puts 1,000 to flight, but two puts 10,000. So we're, we're team people. Uh, some of our teammates got rejected uh, almost from day one, and uh, we were stuck with a situation uh, maybe different than everyone else, but guys, in life, we come against obstacles. We come against giants, and the testimony of your faith is what you do in that moment. And so when stuff's, when stuff's good, we all do good, right? But it's actually the testing of your faith that's, more, that's proved to be more worth than gold. And what you do in those moments 
determines if you're in Hebrews 11 of the people of faith who persevere through trials and persecution, or if you're those who shrink back and just become average, you know. And that's, we, we thank God for those moments, and that's what it says, rejoice in your tribulation, rejoice in your suffering, because God's putting you on stage to see what's really inside of you in that moment. And uh, so much what God has been teaching us, you know, that a righteous man falls down seven times. And what? He gets back up again. And the testimony is that stuff's going to happen in your life. You're going to show up in a country with plans that God wants to use you in. You're going to have a setback. And what you do when you get punched is the testimony. You know, that's, that's going to be your life. That's the thing. That's your crown. It's this, you know, what you do in those moments is what you're casting at the feet of Jesus. So it's not about necessarily, we love the celebration of the people coming to know Jesus and salvation, but it's not necessarily all about that. It's about how you finish. You know, because there's a beginning to every race, but the reality is there's only one wins a prize. And it's never who starts the race that becomes famous, but it's the person who wins the race and runs the race and finishes the race in such a way that that's where the prize is, you know. So we're all in this fight together. We have each other as a family, but it's like, how much does it take to knock you out? That's the question. Is it a little bit? Is it a bad day? Is it, a, is it an argument with your spouse that then derails you? And that's where your strength is determined in how you react to these things. So uh, anyways, we ended up bouncing over to Jordan. Uh, we got there uh, in May, so we had six months on the ground there. And just the reality of what ministry looks like there is... Uh, there's a secret police. And we, we, we got to the, it's a 98% Muslim country where there was 2% that's a church, maybe a third of that is evangelical. Uh, so we found a good church. We get there and we were like, these are our plans. Like God says in Matthew 10, Luke 10, you know, go out and choose, you know, knock on doors, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. Like we're going to do this. And, and the doubt began. You know, the church says, you know, there's, there's this word, it's called muhabarat. And that's the secret police there. They're out there. They're going to find you. If you do this, you're going to get thrown in jail. You're going to get kicked out of the country again. You need to do this and that. And there's so many things where we let fear, the church has allowed fear to dictate their movement to a point where there's no movement. And it's like we've, we call it, you know, in investing, we call it analysis paralysis. It's when you're thinking about everything that could go wrong and you do nothing out of fear of something might happen. You know what I mean? So the church really was in that stage and we're like, God said, go and make disciples of all nations, you know? And in Acts chapter four, when the church first started getting persecuted, they said, are we gonna listen to man or are we gonna listen to God? Are we gonna fulfill the great commission of what God has for us? Or are we gonna shrink back in these moments, you know? So that was a little bit of that apostolic spirit that we were trying to bring in uh, in our never go alone thing. We didn't wanna operate outside of what God had already established in that nation. So we were like, we're gonna slow down, we're gonna link arms with this. And just a quick testimony, when they said that you know no one from the church is gonna go, uh, we had 14 people with us from the local church go out, do ministry, laying hands on the sick, you know, casting out demons. We, we went out on over 50 or 60 occasions with people from the local church into the tents of these nomadic tribes that are moving to and fro. And uh, just one testimony about that. We were, we were meeting with someone from the local church and this guy, kind of a person in every country that's selling sunglasses and, you know, just doing the street business, almost like beggars. And they walked up to us and were like, hey, can we read your palm? And we were like, no, but what, what is this? You know, and it ended up that this was a, a gypsies, uh, gypsy people group, and they're called the Turkmen there, but they're known there as palm readers. The women there are prostitutes. They're the, the lowest of the low. And, uh, but what we saw was an open door. You know what I mean? Because we love the, the testimony in the Old Testament. You go to someone like that, and you touch them, and you become dirty in the Old Testament, and you couldn't go to the temple because the leper touched you. But in the New Testament, Jesus is on a mission to go touch these people because Jesus isn't getting dirty when he touches them. He's seeing redemption in every person. And it's a flip in, mind, flip in your mindset to where we're no longer on the defensive about this sin that's going to get me, but I'm going to go get into the mess, and I'm going to bring restoration and redemption to the drug addicts and to those that need it, and that's the mission of the church. And the reality is, is that the the church, the role of the pastor, the apostle, the prophet was for the equipping of the saints 
for the work of the ministry. And so many times we think that it's the pastor's job to go do the hospital visits, right? That's the pastor's role, you know, but the reality is, is we each have a race to run. And to the degree that you think that your job is to just come to church, God has so much more for you. And the, and the pastor's role was to equip you to go and be the church out there. It wasn't just meant to be the pastors, the five pastors in Buchanan that are going and touching the lost. But it was the, I'm going to embrace this and make it my own. And my thing is, is that I want you guys to have a prize. I want you to stand before Jesus. And it's, it's the verse that I think keeps me in line more than anything. Is that one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our life to God. You're going to get to tell your story about how you, how you moved and what you decided to focus on and what, uh, where my finances were going, where all these things were going. And it was like, if I thought my role was to just come to church, when God actually said, you're part of the church, go and make disciples of all nations. You know, go and baptizing them, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. And it's a switch of power that the Holy Spirit's just not in a pastor that's standing on stage in front of a church that's like, help me with my problems. But God, his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside of you and has equipped you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, you know? And as new creations in Christ Jesus, we are each fully equipped with that Holy Spirit to go and shake nations, to go and touch a city, to go be fathers and mothers to the lost, you know? And that's the reality of the role of the church is that. And uh, just getting into uh, what I've seen since I've been home, uh, just to be transparent, some of our church situations, not this one, but have been messy lately. And uh, in Moorfield and Fairmont and just stuff really close to home for us has been, you know, have just seen people that have started so well yeah. slide. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tailing off just a little bit just lost a little bit of fire at the beginning and then it just kept going in the wrong direction, right? And that's what's, that's what's been close to home for us. And uh, I, just a verse that I had on here, it's Titus 2.12, um, if it's available. If not, it talks about, there it is. Uh, it talks about the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts so that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And this is all based on the grace of God. And I think the understanding of what the grace of God actually does in our life is huge for us. Because for the longest time, a little bit of my testimony, my parents are preachers in Fairmont, uh, was at every youth group, at every Sunday service, raising my hands in worship, doing the whole Christian thing. But from the age of 12 until my freshman year of college, what am I doing when I'm not in church? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I had this facade of like this Christian person who was smart and doing well and going to college and all of these things. But what was happening on Friday night? What was happening on Saturday night? And the reality is, is that we have this thing that like we can be in the kingdom of God and this grace word somehow makes it to where I don't have to commit. And that's not the grace of God. The grace of God teaches me to enter into covenant into a relationship where I set myself apart for this one thing. And that's the grace of God and what it actually teaches us. And that's what we need to finish our race. Because when grace becomes an excuse rather than an empowerment, something's flipped. And that's not what God has, you know, called us into in this age. And that's what I've seen, you know, it's like, we start that way, and Paul so much is like, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, now my reward is in heaven. There's a finishing that has to happen in our race, and I just want to like work that into us so much that, you know, even in these next verses uh, in Revelation chapter 3, the letters to the churches, it says, he who overcomes shall be clothed, clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess him before my father and before his angels. And I, you know, I read this verse and I'm like, you know, if I overcome, my name's not going to get blot out of the book of life. And I'm not here to preach eternal salvation or not. I'm not, it's not about a doctrinal thing for me, but it's like, if he says that if you overcome, I'm not going to blot you out. Like, why would he say I'm not going to blot you out unless you actually had to finish 
and that you actually had to overcome. And it wasn't about the raise your hand altar experience, but that is so important and it launches us into this race, but there's a finishing, there's an overcoming spirit that this grace doesn't just give me an excuse to stay the same, but it actually empowers me to overcome and it changes my life to no longer where I'm taking hits from the world, but I'm an overcomer, you know, and it's a difference when grace is power and not just forgiveness because it, gives, it puts the responsibility on you. It makes you accountable for your race once again, because you have what it takes to overcome. That when God says that you're a new creation, you're my son and daughter, my spirit's in you, you're kings and priests. When he paints this picture for us, it wasn't one of a peasant. It was one of someone who he wanted to put his spirit in. And when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, he gave you what it took to do it. He gave you what it took to influence governments and peoples and your spheres. And you have what it takes to overcome. You have what it takes. God has a plan for you. And we have this thing that, you know, they don't want to hear me. You know, if you go out and preach to the Muslims, they don't want to know, you know, what you're talking about. God says all of creation's longing for the revealings of the sons of God. We have to get our, we have to get our mindset straight, that there's actually opportunity out there and not just persecution, you know, that there's actually people that are longing that you have the thing that actually can change their world. And the role of this pastor to equip the church, you know, Pastor Jerry can go out and, you know, do good and heal the sick and all these things. But what if there's an army of 300? How quick does Buchanan feel that when the people in this church are, take responsibility and say, I have what it takes to change a life and it's Jesus Christ inside of me. And I make myself available to you, God, to do whatever you want to do. You know, so just going on to this, on to Revelation uh, 3, I think it's 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your crown. Yeah. What does it mean for someone to take your crown? You know, these are the questions that are, that are gut-wrenching me in this season right now. What does it mean to start coasting? You know, that I've been in the ministry for 10 years now, and what does it mean to lose my fire just a little bit and to be okay with it? You know, that there's actually a fight for your faith, for people to come and that there is a way to get sidetracked off of the mission of my life. And I just want to, I just want to grind this into you that there's such a need for us to finish our race. You know, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And now my rewards in me for, you know, is in store for me in heaven. And it's, it's that, you know, and for lack of vision, the people perish. Like, you know, and I just feel like there's a moment where you have to step back and be like, God, am I, am I where you want me right now? Do I have my eyes on the prize? You know, and uh, it, the thing about... It's not about a condemnation for not doing enough. Uh, one of my favorite things is Sarah in the Old Testament, where God says, you're going to have a baby, and she laughs. <laughs> you know, she just like in, in disbelief laughs. But there's this uh, testimony of her in Hebrews chapter 11 <laughs> that kind of rewrites the script for her life. Uh, it's Hebrews 11, verse 11, and it says, this is how the New Testament remembers Sarah. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive uh, even when she was past her age because she considered him faithful who had promised. You know, so this same woman who laughed in the face of God when she says, you're going to have a baby, the New Testament remembers her as the one who had faith to have the promise, you know? Yeah. And that's an aspect of the grace of God that we've gotten right, you know? Yeah. That uh, even our, our shortcomings aren't remembered in this book, you know what I mean? Yeah. But God cast our sin as far as the east is from the rest. Our sin and our lawless acts, he remembers no more. And he actually has a reward for us. And my thing about the judgment seat of Christ, it's actually a beautiful thing. Because it's, uh, there's a judgment that's based on the things you've done wrong. It's like, you got a DUI, and this judgment is for 10 years in jail. But then this judgment seat was called the Bema seat, and it was actually related back to the Olympic Games when they started. And this was a judge that wasn't necessarily about condemnation, but it was a judge about, like, you know, Gabby Douglas, 9 out of 10. It's an evaluation of what you did with your life. And this judgment seat of Christ that we're going to stand before isn't rooted on 
You remember that time you drank in college? Here's your punishment for it. But it's about, I'm giving an account of my story. What did you do with what you were given? With your five talents, did you make 10? And that's the good and faithful servant that stewards their life well and doesn't dig a hole in the ground and bury their talent, but they realize that God has given me, given me something and that he's coming back like a business owner and he's gonna say, give an account for what you have given you in your life. And this is the reality of that judgment seat is like, are you paying attention here? Like you have a purpose for these things that you were given and it's not okay to just sit on them. But I have a, a, a plan and a purpose for your life. And this judgment seat is gonna be based on your reward for what you did while he was away. Yes, sir. Yes. We have to flip the way we think of what this church and Christian life experience is. That it's like I received this grace and I was entered into the kingdom of heaven, but God has a plan and a purpose for your life. God has a mission for you. And there's going to be a day when he's going to say, what did you do with those five talents? And I pray to God that it wasn't while I was in church. Because God said, you're the light of the world. He didn't say you were the light of the church. He said, you're the light of the world. And when God says there might be a basket that comes over, have we made that the four walls of the church? Have we hid the light inside of this building when God meant for you to get equipped here and bring it somewhere else? And maybe the, the calling of what did you do with your talents isn't about how you worshiped here, but it's what you did as the light of the world. Maybe that's, where, that's what you're going to be giving an account for is what did we do? You know what I mean? What did you do with those talents? And I just want to encourage you this morning that God has a plan for your life. That there's, uh, there's going to be a day when uh, he's gonna, you're going to tell your story. And I pray that God just changes your heart and just empowers you to go out and be the light of the world. So yes. thank you, Pastor. Uh, I know you have a little bit you want to share. But, uh... You go ahead. I'm not adding to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to let forget. Are you hearing me, church? Yes. Yes. Are we getting it? And it's time, it's, it's, it's these services where we get charged up to go do something, right? It was never about coming to church on Sunday morning, but it's here that we get empowered to go and do the thing that we want to do, you know? And this grace of God, you know, something else God has just been walking me through in this season is, you know, when there are shortcomings around us. Because the reality is, is we never want to sacrifice the standard of God. When God says, you know, adultery is wrong, adultery is wrong. And we don't make an excuse for it, right? And some people, when they get caught in sin, they, they, start, they start trying to change this line and turning things into gray areas. But we have to keep this demand for holiness, you know, the way of holiness. I'm just kidding. But uh, it's, that, it's that reality is that standard says the same, but what happens when someone falls short? You know, and God has just been walking me through a lot of uh, the woman in adultery. Uh, the woman who was, who was down and out. And Jesus never says, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, just, you know, you, you keep doing that thing. You know, I love the, there's a, I don't know what movie it was, but it's a picture and, you know, they're like, Jesus, what do we do with this woman? And he grabs, he picks up a stone and he's flicking it and he acts like he's going to throw it. And then he says, you know, who among you, you know, is without sin? You can cast the first stone, you know, and it says from the oldest to the youngest, they put it down. Because the longer you're in the faith, is the reality is just you're going to realize that you're going to miss the mark sometimes. And you just need the, the grace of God to just be like, dang it, that was just a wrong decision, you know. But then Jesus says, go and sin no more. The standard doesn't change. He still has a path for freedom for every person. But we have to have this grace with others that it's like, it's going to be messy sometimes, right? And people are just going to make mistakes. And we always have the opportunity to throw the stone, to say the word of gossip, to do all those things. And I just think in those moments, we need to have grace for one another and say, I've needed that grace, you know. And that's the same grace that I'm now going to extend to you and trust in you again, hope in you again that God's going to do something great. And as we just uh, keep in this fight, you know, that's just something that God's just calling us into is just dealing with each other with such a grace in a presence and it's when it gets close to home you know sometimes it's hard to it's hard to forgive and forget but there's going to be moments in your life where you have the opportunity for justice right this woman committed adultery and according to the law she should have been stoned and there's going to be opportunities for this justice where god's just asking you you know maybe it's with some of the family that we're about to be with in this next month and god's just saying like 
put down the stone. Like mercy triumphs over judgment, right? You know, the goodness of God draws us to repentance. And it's just called to, you know, for that person needs to own and take responsibility for the mistake. But at the same time, like we have to be a church that just operates in love. And uh, I want to go back to a quick passage that I skipped. It's not on the board. But it's something that, you know, just kind of goes in the same vein. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It talks about the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. And it says they were, you know, if you look at it, it's a crazy story, right? So they're in there, they're in bondage, and the thing that sets them free is what? The blood on the doorpost. Yes, sir. And we see that as, that's us. We were lost and now we're found, right? There is, there's a, a freedom from our bondage in that place. And it says they were all baptized in the, you know, in the, in the Red Sea when they passed through and Jesus, you know, split it. And how many of us, you know, have the blood of Jesus on us? We were baptized, you know, we were in this thing and now comes the journey into the promised land. That's their race, right? That's the, their, their prize is actually the promised land. And now they're entering into this desert and uh, their prize is on the other side of it. And there's some crazy verses in there. I encourage you to read it. First Corinthians 10, I think it's one through 13, but it says, but God wasn't pleased with all of them, you know? And it was this, it's these things that are just hitting me in this season right now that it's like, I got the blood of Jesus, right? I've done the baptism, but with many of them, God wasn't pleased. And in one day, 21,000 fell to sexual immorality, you know? And one day, you know, they were, they were testing God and the earth swallowed them, <laughs> you know what I mean? And in one day they started complaining, right? Just had a bad attitude and God started wiping them out. And there's this like standard of God setting us free from our slavery in Egypt and he's walking us into the promised land. But like, there's still not, we have to watch out for that sin that so easily entangles us. And this grace of God is like, it's there to always help us get back up again, like a righteous man falls, but like we need to stop the stuff <laughs> because it's actually out there to get us, right? Like we actually have to, we have to work through this stuff because, you know, in the parable of the sower even, uh, it talks about, you know, uh, the thorns that come, the cares and concerns of this world. And as I'm walking through the season of just leaders in my life and stuff, just getting caught up in the thorns, it's just little things of this world that just come in and try to derail us. And like, we have to be smart, <laughs> wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You know, that there is a fight for your faith, that there is, there's a real devil that's out to derail you. And we're not just taking hits blindfolded like we don't know what's going on, but that there's, there's a waging of war against you. And it's in these things that like God wants us to be aware and re realize that like God has a race for you to run. You know, God has something he wants to accomplish in your life. So we got we to gotta wake up. But, you know, it talks about in Revelation, we have to strengthen what remains. You know what I mean? And those things in our life, like, I just hope that you're encouraged this morning, Amen. that the grace of God can, can, can clean up your mess, is not frustrated at your past. You know, it says, forget the past beyond and press on to those things that lie ahead, that the grace of God, but at the same time, like, it's not okay for your best days to have been behind you. Like, we have to forget our past yeah. mistakes but like we need to get past the things we did good 30 years ago. We're like the people in high school that are talking about, you know, back in high school. And it's like, you never got past that yet. Like those are still your glory days, right? And it's like, we get that way as a church sometimes where it's like, well, back at Wesleyan, we had a little revival and I'm just gonna ride that. You know, I got beat up in the Middle East six years ago. I'm just gonna share that story for the rest of my life, you know, and make myself. But like, God has something for you today. Like God has something like, when I go to give account of my story and I talk about the, my two years at Wesleyan and I had just told those stories for the rest of my life, it's like you used 1 80th of your time for me. Like that's not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's a failing grade, you know, that, you know, and that's where we get sometimes in the faith is like, yeah, it was great back then. And now I'm just, you know, I'm coasting in and God's like, hold on to what you have so you don't lose your crown. <laughs> like maybe I have something for you today. Like maybe you still have 20 years left. You know what I mean? And there's that, we have to stir up those things in our life that it's like, I have something for you. Like using the fullness of our talents in the midst of that, never getting to a place 
where it's, uh, we're sitting on our talents. And God has just been saying to me, like, do you have oil in your lamp? And it's not, it's not about, like, right, salvation. We maybe, we get saved. But the reality is, is that, you know, the bridegroom's gone for maybe 70 years in our life. And it's not about, did I have oil 70 years ago? It's you have oil today. Because, you know, five of the, five of the virgins thought, you know, oh, it's fine. You know, we'll just get oil where he comes. You know, I used to have it back then. I used it, but I'll go get some more. Like, it's not a big deal. But do you have oil in your lamp right now? Because that's walking by faith and not by sight. That's when you're in the fight of faith is when you have oil in your lamp today. And there's a demand on your life. To, it's not about a story from 10 years ago. It's, are you loving me now? Are you walking in the light today? You know, because in Matthew, it was like, yeah, the, the business guy, you know, the master went away and they, you know, they started drinking a little bit, beating their slaves. And it says when the master comes back and he sees what's happening in that moment, that's really the test, you know. And there's a, there's a part of our faith, there's a part of our salvation. It's like when Jesus comes back, like, do you have oil? Like, are you in the fight today? Are you in intimacy with the Lord today? And it's those types of things that are going to produce fruit in our life and are going to just put a demand on our life to finish our race well. So I just want to pray quick. Jesus, we thank you for this church, God. Yes. Father, I thank you that Paul said he died every single day, Lord. And today we just offer ourselves again as a living sacrifice, Father. We thank you for the outpouring of your spirit in Acts chapter 2, Lord. But I thank, thank, I'm even more thankful for that they needed it again in Acts chapter 4 because they had used what they were given in Acts chapter 2. And they said, God, fill us again. Give us boldness again to finish this race, to, to withstand persecution, Lord. And God, we just pray for people in this church with oil in their lamps today, Father, that they wouldn't be living in the past, Father, of six successes or previous moves of God. But Father, we ask for a fresh anointing today, Father, in Jesus' name. We ask for people that are filled with your oil today, Father, and walking in the faith today, Lord. And we just pray for a move of God in this city, Father, that isn't based on a figure that stands in front of the church, Lord, but that the body of Christ would just embrace their calling and purposes, God. And that even right now, Father, you would just bring people into their minds that you're calling them to reach out to, Lord, of just even older people in this church, you're making them fathers and mothers again of just people in their sphere, Father, that you're calling them to adopt spiritually, Father, and to just own and love as if they were their own children, Father. So we just pray for fresh vision in this church, Lord, and that we would always just walk in the light, Father, as you are in the light, Lord, and that we would have no fellowship with darkness, Lord, but that we would create, just keep ourselves pure, Lord, in this world that's trying to jump up on us, Lord, but that we would just set ourselves apart, Father, as just holy unto you, as just sanctified, as your treasured possession, Father, that that's what you're desiring as a clean and a spotless bride, just set apart unto you, Lord, that has just said, Jesus, you can have me, that I'm here for your purposes, Lord. I'm not here for all the other things of this world, but Jesus, I give myself to you. I set myself apart, Father, for the sake of your name, Father, and we just thank you, thankful for those who are going to run their race well in this place, Father that are not going to stop short, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, that no one's going to take their crown, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, that they're going to be overcomers in this place, Father, that are just going to press into those next levels with you, Lord, in Jesus' name, Father, that there's going to be oil in their lamp, Father, and it's not going to be a one-time filling, Lord, but it's an everyday of just uh, needing that fresh manna to go and do those things, Father, for your kingdom, Lord. So I just thank you for kings and queens in this place, Father, who finish well. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this church, Father. We thank you for Buchanan, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for Wesleyan, Father. We just ask for your breath, Father, in this city. We just ask for this place to be a, just a pillar, Father, in this community as a place of revival, as a city on a hill, Father, in Jesus' name, that people can just look in and see what the kingdom looks like, what freedom looks like, what joy looks like, Father. I just pray that this church, Lord, is just used as a city on a hill in this place and we bless it father we bless it lord in jesus name Thank you. praise god bless you i want you to all stand and 
I want some elders and leaders and ministers just to come to the front real quick, real quick. Those of you that don't wait for me to call on you, you know if you're mature enough in the Lord to pray with somebody. Joey and Mackenzie are coming. Some of our leadership, would you just come on down very quickly? Because this, this is different this morning. I, I had some plans, but uh, matter of fact, if you all have a website, if we could get that put up so people could follow you. He didn't, he didn't say much about what he's doing, but he talked a lot about what God's doing and what God wants to do here. And I appreciate that. And if your heart's been awakened this morning, if you want somebody to pray with you, they're going to be standing over here. Uh, you come up because you have a purpose and God wants you to finish well. You know, uh, the, the same passage says, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And in 1 Corinthians 10, it says the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. You know what that means? You come to church, you hear the word of God, you eat of the bread of life, you drink of his presence, of his spirit, and then you just go out and play. You do nothing with it. And God says, I'm not pleased with that. So if you want to not just be saved, but you want to fulfill your purpose, there are people here to pray with you this morning. If you need to repent of some things, you heard the real message of grace this morning. Not a license to sin, but an ability to be forgiving and graceful to everyone else while God uses that grace to change your life, to make you more like Him.